Well, I'm just going to preach what I feel on my heart today, and uh, I don't, uh, I'm not here to impress anybody. I just want to give you uh, what I feel on my heart after much prayer. Let's turn to the book of Genesis chapter 22, and the book of Exodus chapter 6, Genesis chapter 22, and beginning at verse 13. Pardon me, my voice is giving me some trouble, but Genesis 22 and 13. And Exodus chapter 6. Genesis 22 and 13 and Exodus chapter 6, beginning at verse 2. First we'll read Genesis 22. Genesis 22, 13. If you've got it, say praise the Lord. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called, everybody said called, the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Exodus chapter 6. And verse 2, Exodus 6 and 2. Exodus 6 and 2. Bible said, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. <clears throat> and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Uh, say what? By my name Jehovah was... Abraham called his name. What are you talking about? They didn't know. I, I want to use uh, my title for a rhetorical question uh, here this morning. Do you know God? Do you know? I didn't say could you call his name. I said do you know God? Do you know God? God bless you. You can be seated. Exodus is... Uh, often called the book of pictures by scholars. And the reason why is because um, the book of Exodus, with all of its Red Sea crossing, the attacks on the, on the, on the gods of, of Egypt, by the way, uh, all the plagues that, that attacked Egypt was an attack on the Egyptian gods. And it was God's way of saying, these are not the true God, but the God of the Hebrews. That's the true God. And, and so he attacks uh, the, the Egyptian gods. I'm going to get into some of the Egyptian gods here a little bit later on. But, but Exodus is called the book of pictures because it's very illuminary with its Red Sea crossing, with, its, um, with the attacks again, with the tabernacle layout, uh, Moses in the mountain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In fact, the Hebrew language... It's a very picturesque language. It's very, uh, again, a luminary. And, and so Exodus is called the book of picture. Genesis is called the book of beginnings. Because you have three beginnings in the book of Genesis. You have the beginning of, 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 of the universe. You have the beginning of, of humanity. You have the beginning of the nation of Israel. Uh, inseminated, if you please, into the protective womb of Egypt. There would later be a, 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 a birth pains in the plagues from Egypt. Then there would be a breaking of the water, the Red Sea. Then there would be on the other side of that water an ecstatic utterance of praise and worship in the song of Moses. whole lot there of the way we're born again also. Uh, we're also going to be, there's also going to be some repentance. There's going to be some godly sorrow. There's going to be a breaking of the water. There's going to be, you're going to be baptized in Jesus' name. And, and, and then there's going to be an ecstatic utterance of, of speaking in other tongues when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And, and we read the familiar story of Abraham and Isaac in the offering and how that Abraham says, I and the lad will go to the mountain and we will worship and we will come back to you. Now, there had never been a resurrection up to this time. 
And yet Abraham has a fresh faith. Abraham says essentially by saying that we're going to worship and we're going to come back to you. He's essentially saying that the same God that, it, that, that I'm going to offer my boy to is the same God that can bring him back to me. And, and it's, 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 it's interesting to me that Abraham called sacrifice worship. He was going to, 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 to offer his son and yet he called that worship. We ought to call sacrifice worship. We come to church, we come to worship. We fast, we're worshiping. We pray, we're worshiping. And, and, and the angel intervenes, and the ram is caught in its, in its horns, in the thorns, and there's a whole lot there of symbolism of Jesus Christ, the crown of thorns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Abraham calls the name of the place, Jehovah, he invokes the name of Jehovah. And yet in Exodus, God says to Moses, I appear to them by the name of, 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 of or rather by, by, in the sense of God Almighty, power, Almighty, power. Uh, but by my name, Jehovah, Redeemer, Deliverer, was I not known to them. Now, your atheists and your agnostics jump on that and say, see, We've got, a, we've got a contradiction in the Bible. There's no contradiction in the There may be a contradiction in our understanding of the Word of God, but the Word of God is not inherently uh, contradictory. And, and the, well, I'm going to tell you something that in Genesis, it says that Abraham was the one who called the name of Jehovah. But in Exodus, God's the one who says, they did not know my name. And in Genesis, this gives us man's view of knowing the name and knowing God. But Exodus gives us God's view of knowing the name and of knowing God. And Abraham called and uttered the name, but God said, it's one thing for you to call my name, and it's another thing for you to know my name. The patriarchs called and invoked the name. Uh, they, they knew him in the sense of provision and the sense of blessing and the sense of what he could uh, give them and take care of them. But I submit to you this morning that they did not really know him in the sense of a mighty deliverance and the sense of a mighty, mighty redemption. That tells me that it's possible to know the blessings of God without knowing the redemption of God. You can be blessed by God and still not be delivered by God. You can know the blessings of God and not know the salvation of God. I'm not interested in just knowing what He can give me, but I'm interested in knowing the deliverance of God. I'm interested in knowing Him in power and in might and in deliverance from my infirmities and from the things that hold me down. Let's give the Lord a good hand of praise. Merv Griffin, the uh, ex late talk show host, because I, I, I never, I, I didn't hear it, but I heard about it. Merv Griffin said one time, he said, I would serve the Christian God. He said, but I refuse to serve a God that sent his boy from heaven to do his own dirty work. Now. We say, oh, that's oh, 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 that's absurd. No, that's not absurd. Merv Griffin was on to something. Well, praise the Lord. I remember one time I was uh, in, 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 a, in a Bible, uh, a, a bookstore, my favorite hangout. And, uh, I was in a bookstore and I, was, I heard this guy, uh, overheard this guy say, uh, say that he was in a seminary school in New Orleans, Louisiana. And man, I heard that. And brother, I'm telling you, I was like a, I was like a Texas mosquito outside a blood bank, brother. I got to get in there. I mean, I have got to talk to this guy. And, and so I, I just kind of buzzed around a little bit. And finally, I, I, I just went to him and started talking to him. And, man, when it was over with, we was about two hours later, been outside in the parking lot about nose to nose going at it over doctrine and, and, and so forth. And I, I saw him about two years later at my wife's uh, my wife's family reunion. He, showed, he, he comes up to me. He said, hey, man, he said, uh, you, you remember me? I said, yeah, Corey, yeah. I remember you. How's it going, man? And we started talking back and forth. And he said, uh, he said, you, you remember that debate we had, that discussion we had that time? And I said, oh, yeah, I, I remember that. And he said, uh, he's going to tell you something. He said, I, I, was in old, I was taking Old Testament class at that time. 
He said, and after we had that debate, he said, I went back to, to, uh, to class, to seminary. He said, all that's working on me and, and so forth. And he said, uh, he said the, the, the Old Testament professor got up and made the statement that you cannot use the Old Testament to prove in any way, shape, or form the doctrine of the Trinity. And he said, I'm sitting there. <laughs> And all of this is working on my mind. He says, I just want to tell you something, man. He said, I'm now a one God Jesus name, a baptized in Jesus name. He said, I just want to tell you something. He said, I thank you for that debate. I thank you for that discussion. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there that are hungry for the truth. And they just don't know. And it's our responsibility to tell them, under whom much is given, much shall be required. And we've been given a whole lot this morning. And Jesus walks into Matthew 16. He walks in, uh, along the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And he says, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He got a, a mixed multitude of varied opinions. And I want to tell you something. It's the same way. To, it just depends on who you're talking to. That, that you ask them, who is Jesus Christ? Some of them say he's only the Son of God. They're called Arianists or Socinians. Uh, some say that he is the second person of the blessed Holy Trinity. They're called Trinitarians. Uh, But I want to tell you, Jesus said to believe on me as the Scriptures have said. The Bible says over and over, but what saith the Scriptures? What does the Word of God say? I want you to know this morning you'll not be judged by the Council of Nicaea. You'll not be judged by the Council of Constantinople. You'll not be judged by the Council of Ravenna. You'll not be judged by the Council of Chalcedon. But you'll be be judged by what saith the Word of God. What do the Scriptures tell us this morning? That's what we need to go by. Not what your mama said. Not what your daddy said. Not what your grandma said. Not what your grandpa said. But what does the Word of God tell us? Does the Word of God tell us anything about who He is? That's what you need to stand on this morning. And I'll tell you this, it's not just for the doctrine of oneness. It's for the doctrine of holiness. It's for the doctrine of purity. It's for any doctrine in the Bible. It needs to be tested by the Word of God this morning. I want to tell you something, brother. I heard a story some time back. Of course, I don't care. I don't follow it. But, 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 but I heard a story some time back that, that, that uh, Vince Lombardi, the old, the old football coach for the Green Bay Packers, that there, there, was, a, there was a time when they weren't doing very well in a uh, game, a particular game. And I think I heard Brother Von Morton tell this story one time. I uh, said that they, they weren't doing very well and, and said that uh, during, during halftime that Vince Lombardi just, just was just silent, didn't say nothing to him throughout the whole time. Finally, about the last couple of minutes, he spoke up and he said, now, girls, he said, the way I see it, we need to get back to the basics. And he picked up a football and he said, this is a football. He told them, I want to tell you something, brother. We need preachers that will hold up the oneness of God and hold up Acts 2.38 and say, this is the message. This is the only saving message under heaven given among men whereby we must. We must. I know it's talking about the name, but the name is in the message. The name is in the message. And I want us to understand. Stand here this morning that when we uh, uh, say the, the when we mention the Father, you know there, there's one that's people that are scared to death of Father Son terminology. Father Son terminology does not scare me one bit, brother. Father Son and Holy Spirit together does not scare me one bit, brother. We know there's a distinction, but when you tell me it's a distinction of three divine members, three divine persons, each with their own center of consciousness in God, I got a problem with that. I'm a father, I'm a son, and I've got a spirit. But I'm not three people running around here. I don't, I've got three persons running around here. And we are created in God's image. And so when we say Father, we're talking about the one God of the Bible, transcendent. The one God of the Bible existing outside of creation and time, external to the context of the incarnation. When we mention the Son of God, we're talking about God descendant. Father is God transcendent. Son is God descendant. God manifest and revealed in the
the flesh as a human being in order to save mankind. Holy Ghost is that self-same God working within the power and the context of His creation and His time. It's not three members in the Trinity, but it's simply three revelations or manifestations of God. And in Jesus Christ dwells all the fullness. In Jesus Christ dwells all, 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 all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you can plead in Him and not them. Now I want you to know that, brother, not one discussion that I've ever had has any, any Trinitarian debater ever started with the New Testament. Every time we discuss, they start with the New Testament. Listen, you got to understand the Old Testament and before you're going to understand the New Testament. And that is the fundamental hermeneutical difference between us uh, and the Trinitarian perspective. Uh, their paradigm, and I'm not here to bash the people, you understand. Good people. I, I love anybody. I don't care who they are, brother. I want to see everybody saved. But the doctrine we've got to deal with, uh, it's the doctrine that we're dealing with and not the people. And... Well, praise the Lord. And the Old Testament prepares us to understand the concepts of the New Testament. About 3,000 times, the New Testament refers back to the Old Testament through direct quotations and literary allusions and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I traced it out one time, roughly around 3,000 times. The New Testament writers would write, and then they would say, For it is written, referring back to the Old Testament scriptures. And so, and I, and listen, no carpenter begins to. To, to build a house, and they start with, with, with the roof. Nobody starts with the top. You start with the foundation. And Hebrews 2 and 20 said that we're built upon the foundation uh, of the apostles and the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. Uh, the Old Testament Jewish prophets did not believe uh, in absolute monotheism. Uh, and then the New Testament Jewish apostles had two more persons in the Godhead. They had the same foundation, uh, not a different foundation. Uh, there was one foundation, uh, and there's also just one God, uh, and His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so, in Isaiah 44, listen, 9,000 times at least, we read singular personal pronouns used by Yahweh in, in and of himself. He refers to himself over and over as a single, singular unit, using a single person pronoun. When I took Greek online, I was amazed. He, they, they, they would refer to single person pronoun, and they would say, well, this is one person, single person pronoun. And I, every time they would say that, I would think to myself, well, I wonder if that refers, if you're going to hold that same criteria to the Old Testament Yahweh, who said over and over and over, I, for example, am the first and the last, uh, and beside me, single person pronoun, is there none other? Uh, what do we read in Revelation? Uh, but Jesus Christ saying, I am the first, uh, and I am the last, uh, the Alpha, the Omega. And in fact, the Greek text says, uh, Hateos, the Almighty God, uh, in Revelation 1 and 8, uh, Isaiah 43, he said, beside me, single person pronoun, there is no Savior. In Titus 2 and 13, we read of Jesus Christ looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 40, the one Old Testament Yahweh said, beside me, single person pronoun, there is no God. Uh, 1 John uh, 5 and 20 said, Jesus Christ, uh, this is the true God uh, and eternal life. Uh, Isaiah 45 said that under Yahweh, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 said at the name, at the mention uh, of the name of Jesus, uh, every knee is going to bow and every tongue I'm going to confess uh, to the glory of God the Father. Uh, Isaiah 35 said, your God shall come. The Jews' God shall come. The Jew, your, your God, but plural possessive pronoun, your God's going to come. Then shall the blind eyes be opened. Then shall the deaf ears be inside. Then shall the lame leap, for, for lame leap up and down. When did that happen, brother? Whenever Jesus Christ came and the Old Testament said that will be the Jewish God. The Jews have never worshipped the Trinity and neither should the New Testament church. Your God's going to come. Your God's going to come. 
We were in Santa Monica last week, and I walked up to an ultra-Orthodox Jewish man who was walking there. And, and I went up to him. I, I said, sir, can I ask you a question? He said, yes. I said, the word it called, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is, is one. The, the Hebrew um, adjective that is a cod. Some people tell us that this word can mean a composite unity because, for example, Adam and Eve are called one. And so some denominal folks will say, well, see, Adam and Eve are called one and they're two persons. Therefore, this shows that this word can mean a composite unity. And therefore, it's applied when it's applied to God, then it can also mean a composite unity. Therefore, we can have more than just one person in, in the Godhead. Uh, he looked at me very quizzically. He said, sir, he said, Adam and Eve are not God. He said, they are created by God. He said, what is your question? Can I remind you that Jesus said in John chapter 4, the Jews know what they worship, and if they've never known a trinity, and Jesus said they know what they worship, brother, then I think we're safe to say that just the one Yahweh of the Old Testament became manifest in the flesh as a man to save us from our sins. He also said a few things about Deuteronomy 22 and 5, too, but I, I won't get into that right now. But in Malachi 2 and 10, the Bible says, uh, uh, Bible says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? John chapter 14, Philip says, Hey, well, I've I'm, I'm been hearing all this talk about the Father. Show us the Father, and I'll be satisfied. I'll be, I mean, that's all I want to see. Philip said to him, Have I been with, or rather, Jesus said to him, Have I I've been with you all this time, and you're still asking to see the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? For the Father that dwelleth in me, for the Father that dwelleth in me, for the Father that dwelleth in me, he's doing the work, and he's still working in the year 2014 through Jesus Christ. And so we turn over to the New Testament, and it's a seamless transition, brother. Nothing is broken. There is no discontinuity. There is no break in the identity of God. Why do we never see father-son interaction under the Old Testament? If there's two, etern- two co-eternal persons under the Old Testament from eternity, why do we never see father-son interaction under the Old Testament? Then you turn to the book of Matthew and you see tons of it. What changed? I'll tell you what changed. God added flesh to himself that he didn't have in the Old Testament. God added humanity. And because of that addition, there's an addition of interaction that there wasn't under the Old Testament. Thank God this morning for this revelation. Thank God this this morning for this truth. I don't get tired of preaching it. I don't get tired of hearing it. I can listen to it all the time. I don't worship the doctrine of God, but I do worship the God of the doctrine. And so he turns over to Mark chapter 12. A scribe comes to him and the scribe says to, says to him, uh, which is the first of all the commandments? Now, man, I don't have time to get into this, but if you follow the consistent pronoun usage in Mark chapter 12, a scribe came to him, single person pronoun, Jesus, and the interaction is back and forth. The scribe said to him and asked him, one person, Jesus, which is the first of all the commandments, and Jesus said to him back, single person pronoun, the pronoun usage, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We'll get into the Greek of that. If I got into the Greek of it, it's really definitive that this is one person. It's the masculine singular high, but I don't want to get into all that. But the consistent pronoun usage. And then the scribe says back to him, Jesus, one person, that you have well said that there is no other God and that there is only one and there is none other but him. Single person pronoun. The consistent usage of the pronoun denotes one person. Jesus said, oh boy, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're doing good. Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus didn't say, oh, there's two others that you're missing. Jesus said, you're doing good. You're getting close to the kingdom of God. If Jesus could could endorse the concept of one person in the Godhead, I can endorse the concept of one person in the Godhead. There is a teaching called Gematria. Gematria is the numerical value of alphabet. 
and the alphabetical value of numbers, they crisscross. You can spell numbers in other words. Uh, I talk to many people. I, I, anything I'm preaching today, I promise you, I've confirmed over and over and over. I am very, very meticulous in checking my documenting my sources. In John chapter 21, uh, the, the Jesus, after the resurrection, now they were fishermen, okay? They fished all the time. But they never count the fish all throughout Scripture. But after the resurrection, we find where that they count the fish. The, Jesus walks alongside the beach, tells them, cast your net on the right side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they do that, and the Bible said that they, when they counted the fish, they tallied them up. It came to 153. Now, if you look at the gematria of that, I talked to Brother Conroy about this one time, Joseph Conroy about this. If you look at the gematria, that is the alphabetical value of 153, and you cross it over, it literally says, I am the Almighty God. The next verse said, for they durst not ask who he was, knowing that it was the Lord. They understood the message, brother. They got the red message after the resurrection that he had indeed vindicated himself as the almighty God, risen from the dead in the form of a man. And, and you read, you read in the Bible, or that the Bible says that the woman had an issue of blood and she's had this issue for how long? Twelve years. Jesus is on the way to heal Jairus' daughter. Jairus, obviously a Jew. He's on the way to go touch the Jewish people, if I could say it like that. And he's on the way to touch. How long, how old, rather, was Jairus' daughter? Twelve. The lady gets the disease the same, around the same time frame that Jairus' daughter is born. Now, I personally believe that this was a Gentile lady. In fact, Eusebius, the ancient historian, writing around 300 A.D., uh, he, he said that she was a Gentile from Caesarea Philippi. And the reason I believe she's a Gentile lady is because a Jewish, uh, and then we have history documentation also, but a Jewish lady would be familiar with the Levitical law that said that no, no, no woman that has an issue of blood, shall t- whatever she touches, shall become unclean. It would be very doubtful that she would go amongst all the scribes and the Pharisees and all the lawyers uh, there doing that, knowing that, but an ignorant Gentile would do that. Uh, again, Eusebius said she was a Gentile. And so here we have the picture of the Gentile bride, the Gentile lady coming in, and she touches the hem of his garment. But Jesus is on the way to go heal and go touch the Gentile, the, rather the Jewish people. And so he's reaching out to the Jewish people and the Gentile people at the same time. There's neither Jew nor Greek. For you're, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he's reaching for the Jewish people and the Gentile people at the same time, simultaneously. And the Bible says that she touched the hem. Of his garment. Him. We read that. Him. Him. If you look it up in the Greek, it literally means fringes. She touched the fringes. Jesus was an Orthodox Jew who wore a prayer shawl. I assure you they'd have never allowed him to walk into the synagogue and pick up the scroll of Isaiah without wearing a prayer shawl. It wouldn't have happened. And, and, and so Jesus is there, and she touches the fringes. Now, again, go look up the lexical data on this, uh, Bowers' lexicon, on and on. It, it actually means the fringes. She touched the fringes of his prayer shawl. Remember gematria. They took eight strands and tied five knots. You have the, you have the blue. I know, I know everybody can't see it from where you're at, but you have the blue windings, seven, eight, 11, 13, comes to 39. Um, the number 8 in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. For example, uh, they were circumcised on the eighth day. New beginning. Uh, Noah, during the days of Noah, there was to be a new creation, and there was eight souls saved that would, that would invoke that new, uh, new creation. The first day of the week is the eighth day, and it's a new beginning. Uh, David was a youth a new beginning, and he was a new king of Israel, and he was the eighth son of Jesse. Solomon was, the, was, a, was a new king, and he was the eighth son of David. Uh, there's eight resurrection stories in the Bible other than Jesus Christ. You have three in the Old Testament, three in the Gospels, and two in the book of Acts. Eight New Testament writers. So eight's the number of, of, of new beginnings. The number five is the number of grace in the Bible. 
uh, 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 God brought living things into existence on the fifth day. Life is always the emblem of God's grace. Always the symbol and object, rather, of, 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 of God's grace. Abraham was certainly the recipient of God's grace. Abraham did nothing in and of himself to deserve the unmerited favor of God. And it's interesting to me that Abraham, as a recipient of God's grace, God takes, uh, God changes the fifth letter of his name with the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the geometry of that is five. Uh, the, the, the five loaves fed 5,000, certainly God being gracious, a five-fold ministry. The number five is the number of grace, something that God gives us that we don't deserve at all. When you take and you look at this, eight, five, and you look at the, at the stripes here, the, or rather the, the winding, seven, eight, eleven, of uh, thirteen. When you look at the winding right here, the seven and the eight, he crosses it over, it crosses over into Yah or Jah. That's what it means, by the way. I have, I have confirmed this with several people, including Jewish rabbi. Yah. You look at 11, the third set of windings. It crosses over. It says, Ve or Hova. You look at the last set of windings. You cross it over. It's 13. It caught one. It says, Yahweh is one. That's what she touched. Listen, H, new beginning, five, 39. Right here. You, have, you have seven, eight, 11, 13. 39, and by his stripes we are healed. Look at it. It says a new beginning of grace when one God shed his blood with 39 stripes. That's what she tapped into, and that's what you and I are tapping into this morning. Thank God that we're a part of the Gentile bride, and things have been revealed to us that have been revealed to nobody else. And the angels desire, and the prophets desire to look into the things that have been revealed to us. We're a blessed people. People this morning. I said we're a blessed people this morning. Thirty nine. 39 stripes. How many books are there under the Old Testament? 39. Brother, he walked into the synagogue and picked up the scroll of Isaiah, and he was holding the emblem of him. He was the scroll of Isaiah. He was Deuteronomy. He was the book of Genesis. He was the Word made flesh. He was Ruth. He was the Old Testament. He was every Old Testament. He was Zephaniah. He was Zechariah. He was Isaiah. He was all of it. He was holding a part of himself. And the names of the first ten men in the Bible are very, very instructive. It speaks of the incarnation. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Hunan means sorrow. Mahaliel means blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death shall bring. Lamech means despairing. Noah means rest or comfort. Remove the names of the first ten men. Leave their meanings and their pristine meanings. It says man appointed to mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down. Teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. Aren't you glad this morning that the blessed God came down and he's here to give you rest and comfort? If you're here in despair, if you're here and you're cast down, we serve the blessed God that came down and He's here to teaching through the Word of God to give you rest and comfort. Give Him a good hand of praise. And so we have the ten names who represent the incarnation. Then we have the twelve tribes of Israel which foreshadow His sonship. Simeon means hearing. Judah means praise. Reuben means see a son. Gad means pierced. Issachar means he will bring reward. Naphtali means struggle. Manasseh means forgotten. Ephraim means fruitful. Asher means happy. Dan means rule. Zebulun means reside. And Benjamin means son of the right hand. Again, remove the names. Uh, re- just leave the meanings. The 12 tribes of Israel says, hearing praise, when we see a son pierced, he will bring his reward. Our struggle shall be forgotten, will be fruitful and 
and happy when we rule and reside with the Son of the right hand? Aren't you glad someday that our struggle will be forgotten and we'll rule and reside with Him? Hold on, saint of God. Just one more tear. One more day of fasting. I know you may be going through it, but one day it will all pass and we'll rule and reside with the Son of the right hand. I'm telling you, He's not just the Son of God, but He's God also. There is a duality in Jesus. There is a distinction between the Father and the Son. Doesn't scare me one bit. Thank you, Jesus. And so, in the book of Zechariah 9 and 9, we miss something. It says that the prophecy... And it says that, says that he shall come in riding lowly and meek, riding on a donkey and a colt. On a donkey and a colt. Matthew records the same thing. Remember, Matthew is written to the Jewish people. Matthew's going to quote the Old Testament more than any other of the gospel writers because he understood that he was writing to the Jewish people and he knew they were going to check it out every bit, every single iota of it to make sure it was right. So he made sure that he supported what he was saying with the scriptures. And so Matthew is very careful to quote it exactly as it appears in, in the text. And you read in Zechariah 9 and 9, the Bible says that he would come in on a donkey and on a colt. Now, I'm told that, and I've been doing a lot of research on this, and I'm still digging, but here is what I have come up with so far. Here's what I have found. I've been told that, and I wanted to search it out to make sure this was right, that during times of peace, that a king, kings and princes would ride in, and the king would ride in on the donkey, and the princes would ride in on the colts. Father, rise in on donkey. Son, rise in on colt. I want you to know that Jesus Christ came in, and he doesn't come in just on one, but he comes in on both, because he's not only the King of Kings, but he's also the Prince of Peace. He's not only the Son of God, but he's also the Eternal Father. He comes riding in on both, because he is both. He is both the Father, and he is both the Son, and he is the Holy Ghost, and we are completing him. The donkey representing the Jewish people tied at their beasts of burden. And they've been burdened by the Mosaic law. But the colt, it has its liberty. The colt representing the Gentiles that are untamed. And Jesus comes in on both, representing that he is the God of the Jews. And he's also the God of the Gentiles. He's the same God of the Jews. And he's the same God of the Gentiles. The God of the Jews didn't worship a trinity. And the God of the Gentiles won't worship a trinity either. And so we read in the book of Genesis that Isaac is circumcised. Then, a little bit after that, they invoke, he gets his name, he's called Isaac. By the time we reach to the New Testament time period, during, in the book of Luke, for example, you can read where John the Baptist is circumcised. And where he circumcised, the Bible said, then they would call his name. They would receive their family name at circumcision when they get their name. Because they're entering into covenant, you understand. And so they would get, get their name. And, 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 and so Luke, John, Luke records that John receives his name at circumcision while he is entering into covenant relationship with Yahweh. Along comes Jesus, who is Yahweh. And Jesus is coming. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 2 that whenever he was circumcised and they called his name Jesus. Uh, what in the world that got to do with us and your message here this morning, Brother Perkins? Well, Colossians chapter 2 says that in Christ you also are circumcised with a circumcision made without a hand, uh, having been buried with him in baptism. Uh, and just like they were entering into covenant relationship and they got a name invoked over them when they were entering into covenant. So you and I, when we're entering into covenant relationship with Him, there's going to be a name that's invoked over you in the waters of baptism. And it's the name that's above every name. It's the name that the mention of every knee is going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess. And you enter into covenant relationship with Him. And the name is called upon you. And thus shall we ever be with the Lord. Thank God today for walking in covenant relationship relationship with Jesus. you got your family name. It's circumcision, brother. And Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not named. They are titles that describe the name. They are genitival uh, phrases that point back to the name of Nama, the name of Jesus. And I have 
heard where some people, I've read where some people have tried to negate what I'm about to tell you. And they're just as wrong as they can be. Just as wrong as they can be. During the time of Jesus, whenever he was crucified, we read that he's hanging on the cross. And we read that the Jews say, you take that down. He, you take down that he said he's the king of the Jews. But you take down that he said he was the king. Not that he is the king of the Jews, but that he said he was the king of the Jews. Now, if you look at the lettering, and by the way, I didn't get this from some tape. I didn't get this from online. I got this from personal research. I studied this out. And, and whenever, you, whenever you look at the name and you look at the writing that's over the cross, remember that they, that they were very familiar with the acrostics. The book of Lamentations, for example, is way, way full of acrostics. I, I, I could teach a whole lesson on Lamentations, but it's written in acrostic form. Acrostics is simply where the, you look at the first letter of, of a phrase or, or a word or something, and you see the consistent, repetitive usage of it. After a while, and it takes a little while, but after a while, it becomes very obvious that this is intentional. After a while, Lamentations and the book of Psalm is well familiar with that, which, by the way, the book of Psalm is quoted more than any other Old Testament book in the New Testament. Hence, the New Testament writers are endorsing the concept uh, from, from the book of Psalm. And it's a, repeatedly, you find acrostic form. So when you look at the writing that is over the name of Jesus, remembering that the Jewish people read from right to left, Gentiles read from left to right. It's very interesting that Jerusalem, every nation from its right, they read from right to left. Every nation to its left, they read from left to right. What does this tell us? This tells us that Jerusalem is the pivot point of the whole world. No wonder Jesus went to Jerusalem to be crucified. Everything centers around the crucifixion. Everything centers around what he did at Calvary. And so you read there and you look at the lettering over there and you look at the specific lettering and it says Y H V H. The Tetragrammaton. Yahweh. And Jesus is hanging there, and the Jewish people come along, and they say, oh, no, that's not our Messiah. Oh, no, that's not Yahweh. You take that down. He's not Yahweh. But it was Yahweh that was hanging there. They didn't even understand what it was. But it was over and said, Yahweh, this is Yahweh that is hanging here, that has been crucified. And Jesus, remember, in the book of... First Corinthians, getting back to baptism for a moment, book of First Corinthians chapter 10, remember it says that when they crossed through the Red Sea and that this was a type or a shadow, remember, Paul says they were all baptized in the cloud, heavenly baptism, and in the sea, water baptism. So Paul specifically says that the crossing of the Red Sea is a type or a shadow of our deliverance. And he says, water and spirit baptism. Why in the world would he even mention baptism is not necessary for salvation? It would make no sense. And, and, and so he, 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 he's talking about that there. Remember what happens at the Red Sea. Here, come, here, is, here is Moses standing here, the representative of, of, of the people. Here is two million people at least behind him. Here is the nation of Israel, excuse me, nation of Egypt, pursuing in hot pursuit. Here's the Red Sea, the water. And Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. If you look up this word in the Hebrew text, salvation, it is pronounced as Yeshua. Does that sound familiar? If you transliterate that into Greek, it would be Iesus. If you transliterate it over into English, it would be Jesus. So here you have uh, the, uh, Moses uh, standing over the Red Sea, standing over the people before they enter into the water. And he invokes the name of Yeshua, Iesus, or Jesus over the people before they enter into the water. Aren't you glad a preacher one day stood over you and invoked the name of Jesus over you before you entered into the water? And then your past was washed away. The the Egyptians was washed away. Don't let nobody pull nothing out from your past. Don't let nobody pull up an Egyptian again. If God put it in the sea of forgetfulness, who is man to ever resurrect it again? Oh, come on. I believe God deserves a good hand. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You ought to show forth the praises of Him. Of Him. Of not them, but of Him that called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. It's a marvelous light this morning. And in Isaiah chapter 12, I'm trying to bring it to a landing, but in Isaiah chapter 12, 
It says, Yahweh is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Yeshua. Yahweh has also become my Jesus. <laughs> Thank God this morning that he's not this. We know, we understand that God didn't love humanity enough that the Father looked at the Son and ordered him to go down and be beaten and crucified. But he loved us enough that he came down and he offered himself. His own arm brought salvation. He didn't send nobody else's arm, but his own arm brought salvation to us. And in 2005, archaeologists stunned the world with the earliest finding, the earliest church house, church sanctuary that was ever found. It's pre-Constantine era, dating to around, probably around 300 A.D. You can look this up online. And... It's, again, the earliest church house that, that they found up to now, it was under a prison in Megiddo, Israel. And they, back during those days, they would dedicate the building to the one who purchased it, primarily. It was, you know, whoever would, would, would give the money for it or whoever would purchase the building, they would usually put a little mosaic somewhere, something on the tile or something like that, dedicating the building to the one who, in honor of the one who purchased it. What's interesting is, and I've actually seen the lettering, I actually read it myself, you can look at it yourself, and what's interesting is there was a mosaic on the tile in this, in this church building, and it was dedicated to the one that purchased it. And it says, to the God, Jesus Christ. Nothing there about Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Nothing there about a trinity. Nothing there about first, second, third, prayer. Just to the God, Jesus Christ. No, you're not, you're not your own. You've been purchased. You've been purchased. You've been purchased with a price. And the price of the blood of the Lamb is what purchased us. He's the God, Jesus Christ. I'm almost finished, but how important is this? I'll tell you how important it is, brother. John chapter 8. Jesus said to them, If you believe not that I am, and I know the he, we quote, but your pastor already knows that he is in italics, meaning that it was not in the original manuscript, but it's called euphemy. And in translation process, it just kind of give, gives a little bit of a flow. But what that means is Jesus did not say, if you believe not that I am he. Jesus said, if you believe not that ego I am, I am, you shall die in your sins. It's sin to not believe that Jesus Christ is the one great I am that I am that was called out to Moses Called. Isn't it amazing that the writer of Hebrews, talking about that situation, how it says that, talking about uh, how that Moses refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of, of God. And then it says, choosing the suffering of Christ. Moses understood in typology. You understand. Well, I don't know if you understood it or not, but it's typology here. And he, Jesus said, if you believe not that I am you will die in your sins. But you know what? We can quote and, and, and we can have our doctrine down just pat. And we can have, but I want you to know that God will also confirm this to you in the spirit realm. And, hey, brother, I want to tell you something. Many, many, oh God, the hours that I spent in, in, in church houses all by myself, uh, day in, my wife, I'll tell you, day in and day out, just me and a Bible, brother. I would, I, what about this right hand stuff, God? What about John 17, 5, God? Glorify thou me with the glory I had with you before the world began. What about Colossians chapter 1, God, uh, that the Son was, was used in creation? What about all this stuff? And I would study and read, and God would help me to understand it. I don't care about being Pentecostal. I want to be saved. Hey, brother, I don't care about just uh, having a name tag on me. I want to be a Bible-believing Christian. And so I don't care what Pentecostalism tells me. I care what the Word of God tells me. This is what's going to judge me, not the Pentecostal people. And I want to make sure I wasn't being uh, uh, just brainwashed by something. You understand? I want to make sure this was right, and it is. Listen, Elder David Trammell, you can be seated. I'm almost done. Elder David Trammell was preaching... In Auburn Hills, Michigan. And I can put you on the phone with this guy. Okay, you can talk to him yourself. He was preaching in Auburn Hills, Michigan. There was a lady that happened to be visiting there from Saudi Arabia. She inquired after church. She comes to the host pastor, uh, Elder David 
Chama was preaching there. He was not the host pastor. And she comes to the host pastor and she asks, where did this man learn Arabic? She's from Saudi Arabia. He said, I don't, I doubt brother, brother Trammell doesn't know Arabic. She said, well, while he was preaching, he said to me in perfect Arabic, there is but one true God and he is Jesus of Nazareth. Pastor in Texas, I, I, I didn't get his name, but I can get his name for you. Had a local Jewish man who speaks seven languages, just a genius man. They had a blowout service and people speaking in tongues. After service, the man comes to the pastor and he asked him, again, this man speaks seven languages. He asked him about this and he says, well, you know, do these people know any kind of language? Or he said, because somebody spoke to me in ancient Aramaic uh, uh, while this worship service was going on. Uh, and they said, in perfect ancient Aramaic, uh, we worship the one true God. Missionary to Peru, Brother Keith Nix, uh, 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 back in, uh, what, October, I think it was, of this last year, October the 13th, you know what I'm fixing to say? They, they had a lady who received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, and Brother Nix was saying, and they were there, and they heard her, and she was saying in English over and over, I love you, Jesus, you are the mighty God. I love you, Jesus, you are the mighty God. I'm telling you, it's a great revelation this morning, and if you're hungry, and if you're sincere, and you really want to know, and you're not confused by the spirit of religion and the spirit of the traditions of men, God will help you know the truth. Remain standing. Listen. 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 I'm not through. I almost am, but I'm not. Brother Hood, Jason Hood, was pastor, was assisting a pastor in East Texas some years ago. He's now a missionary over in Belize. One night they had a, and, and again, we can put you in contact with Brother Hood. He can tell you this himself. He was there. Uh, one night they had a man who come in, a visitor, come sit on the back row. And during the worship service, the man comes running up. They don't know this guy. And, and the man comes running up and he grabs the pastor and he says to him, I've got to be baptized in Jesus' name right now. Very, very shaken, visibly shaken, pale. The pastor directed the man, they don't know him, the pastor directs the man to a room over here with a robe, and he asks Elder Hood to go find out what this cat's deal with. What's this dude's problem? So he goes over there, uh, Brother Hood walks in, Brother Hood said, I witnessed him, said the man, the man was visibly shaken, the man was visibly pale. And he asked, how did you teach all these people in this church Hebrew? Brother Hood said, Friends, you're in East Texas. They barely speak English, <laughs> let alone Hebrew. But here's the man's story. The man was raised as an Orthodox Jew. He reads and writes Hebrew. He left Judaism. Actually, they threw him out because he married a Gentile woman. Obviously, a no-no in Orthodox Jewish circles. They threw him out. He described a lady in the church at Brotherhood, obviously knew who it was. He said that during the worship service, she looked at him and said in perfect Hebrew, Why do you wait? Accept your Messiah and be baptized in his name. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> the man said then the whole church began to speak judgments of hell and judgment and warning that the man was not baptized. In Jesus' name. And that's what caused him to run to the front. Uh, Brother Hood said the man died in the truth four years later. And he had an unbelievable amount uh, of uh, understanding of the oneness of God. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, and I'm asking, do you this morning know God? Uh, let's lift our hands right now and thank the Lord. Uh, come on, can we? Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, if you want to come stand around our front. I believe God deserves a little response this morning. He can leave you somewhere in a denominal church. You can be somewhere this morning where you think you're okay. But God, let a little light from heaven. Fill your soul. And if you're here this morning, and you don't have the Holy Ghost, <laughs> you can leave here full. 
You can leave here baptized in His name. Why do you wait? <laughs> Come on, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> 